Dr. Tyson, I am not ashamed to admit I am completely starstruck to be here standing next to you. Well, thank you. I am, <laughs> I'm such a big fan of yours. And I have been following your thoughts on Interstellar on Twitter, but mm -hmm. since this forum allows us more than 140 characters, yes, I thought does. we'd play around <laughs> with that. On a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being absolutely, completely not plausible, 10 being very realistic, where would you place Interstellar on that scale? I would say that the science was ambitious and the science that they tackled, black holes, wormholes, relativistic time dilation, I mean, they went all out for that. And so uh, I'd give it an eight or nine out of 10 on this. Wow, that's, oh, yeah. that's very impressive. Well, they had a real advisor, a real science advisor who was also executive producer. And his, uh, his name is uh, Professor Kip Thorne, and he's a friend of mine, and, and, and he, he's an expert on Einstein's general theory of relativity. These tidal waves that we've been seeing in the trailers and the promotional materials, could that actually happen on a planet? When I first saw it, I said, wait a minute, if you have a wave, that wave needs water that would otherwise surround it, such as in a tsunami. And they're, yes, they're in low level water, they're like wading there. but. The wave comes and that water level doesn't change until the wave comes. I said, no, that's not real. And then, then I read Kip Thorne's companion book, The Science of Interstellar, and he made it clear that these waves are literal tidal waves. They're not tsunamis. And what's a tidal wave? It's a bulge in the water that surrounds the planet. And that bulge is created by strong tidal forces from the outside, in this case, a black hole. This planet is orbiting a black hole. And so what actually happens in a tidal wave is that the solid planet rotates in and out of the wave. So it looks like the wave is coming to you, but in fact, you're being rotated towards it. That's true even if you're on the shores on Earth. You say, oh, the tide is coming in, the tide is coming out. No, no, you're rotating under a tidal bulge of water that is fixed in space around Earth angled towards near where the moon and the sun are at any given time. So I said, fine. Now, the, the, that, the tidal wave was a little spiky, and, and real tidal bulges are kind of more round than that, but I'll give it to them. I'll give it. <laughs> I, I'm a fan of, uh, Mark Twain once said, first get your facts straight, then distort them at your leisure. So I'm saying, okay, you, you want to wave and you want to make it exciting, go for it. Because otherwise they would have just all sort of bobbed up and then bobbed down like a duck on a wave that went by, and that wouldn't make an interesting scene. So I actually will grant, personally grant, a movie creative latitude, provided they started with the right idea. And then take, then have fun with it. Go, go, go for it. This idea of wormholes... Can they exist naturally, or does it have to be placed there by some species? Yeah, or it's some alien with far more intelligence right. and power over space-time than we have. So we, we, we think we understand the mathematics and physics of wormholes. We can write down the equations to create one. But we don't know how to make one otherwise. We don't have the control over matter and energy. Because what is a wormhole? It is a particular distortion of space and time that allows you to sort of pass through a tear, a, 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 a portal, from where you are in this part of the universe to another part, without actually having to tr take the whole journey. Imagine taking a sheet of paper and folding it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want to get from here to there, and you fold it, and then you just take a little, little, little portal right there. That's the wormhole. Okay. Then you unfold it and say, hey, I crossed the entire diameter of the galaxy during the TV commercial or whatever, whenever you'd be doing this. So that's what a wormhole would do for you. And it'd be really useful for any science fiction storytelling. And because they, had, they were properly advised in Interstellar, uh, they got the physics of that right. As you come upon a wormhole, what would that look like? And you'd see this sort of distortion in space. And it's a hole in any direction you approach it. That's the freaky part. When we think of holes, you think of like a hole you would step into and fall through and come out the other side. Well, in this case, you are coming out the other side, but it's in another dimension. <laughs> so you could fall into it. You'd enter a wormhole from any direction at all and disappear and show up somewhere else. That's what's cool about it. In the film, we see Matthew McConaughey's character come out of a black hole alive in one piece. I, from what I understand about black holes and my knowledge is, is very minimal, I didn't think that that was possible. Is that possible? Well, black holes are bad no matter <laughs> what, all right? You should, if there's a black hole there and not over here, go there instead. <laughs> go where there isn't a black hole. Yes. So what I found was odd was the, the fact that 
they found planets that might serve as replacements for Earth orbiting black holes. I'm thinking, no, we, we already have a thousand planet candidates in our catalog, none of which are orbiting black holes, and many of which look better than the ones portrayed in the film. So, so I, I don't think there's any universe in which we're going to have to go to a black hole planet in order to save Earth. Uh, but, of course, that added more drama to the storytelling. If you're in a planet orbiting a black hole, you're deep in what we say is the gravitational well of the black hole. And the deeper down you are in it, the slower your time ticks relative to everybody else. So, and that... so then you get this time dilation effect, it's called. Yeah. And we saw an extreme amount of time pass while he was in that black hole and around that black hole. Correct. Could that actually happen? Oh, yeah. That we, we, yes, it happens all the time. We can measure this. Uh, in fact, it happens daily. No. GPS satellites orbiting high above Earth are farther away from Earth's gravity than we are on the surface. Okay. It is in a different time reference frame than we are. And you calculate what that difference is using Einstein's equations of general relativity, and GPS satellites are pre-corrected when they beam the time down to us oh. to compensate for relativity. So it's happening all around us. All around us. All around us. The timekeeping is so precise that even for something as measly as Earth, and it's weak gravitational field relative to a black hole, this effect is still there. And we can measure it and we compensate for it in our daily communication with the GPS satellites, for our cell phones, for our uh, navigation devices and everything else we use them for. So it is real. Now in the movie they just brought it to a, an extreme example with a black hole rather than Earth's surface. And yes, the, you can calculate where you'd have to be, how close you'd have to be to the black hole to get that difference in the rate at which time ticks. And so they did that. So you'd have to be uncomfortably close to the black hole. But again, that's the sort of the cinematic license that they're taking to add to the drama of the storytelling. Finally, let's talk about this mind-bending conclusion to Interstellar. Is there a chance that in some other alternate universe there is a parallel depiction of, of Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson and Simone Boyce who could be actually puppeteering this interview that we're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there may be a multiverse out there where we in our universe are just one of many. That's not even philosophically much of a stretch. There was a day we imagined that Earth was alone in its sort of meaning in the universe and we find out we're just one of, you know, eight planets. Yes, I said eight planets. Um, <laughs> Uh -oh. Get over it. No, <laughs> sorry. So um, then we saw the sun. We said, well, the sun is a special thing in the sky. Nothing else looks like it. We find it's just one of all a billion, hundred billion other stars in the galaxy. Oh, galaxy special. No, we're just one of 50, 100 billion galaxies. Well, the universe is special. Well, maybe not. Maybe our universe is one of many. And so there's, there's good historical precedent for the universe having more than one of anything and everything. In other words, the universe, as far as we know, has never made one of anything. So why would there even be one of itself, perhaps? And so if that's the case, then molecules are assembling and the forces of nature conspire to make stars and planets and possibly life. It's not crazy to imagine there are other places where we could be having this, the evil counterpart of ourselves, or having this, <laughs> I was going to say, in the evil universe, I'll have a mustache. No, but I actually have a mustache in this universe. I'll have a mustache, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's possible, but I, there's so many variations. Uh, I think it's narcissistic to say, where's the variation that has me in it? And suppose it did have you in it. It's just, they're different molecules. It's not you. It really isn't you, even if it has all the same molecules assembled in the same way. Your twin has all the same molecules assembled in the same way with identical DNA, but it's not you. You're still you. So I don't, to say I want to live forever in another universe, uh, where are you going with that? I'm cool right here. <laughs> oh, one other thing I didn't answer sure. was, uh, how, can you survive going in and out of a black hole? Mm -hmm. 
you will surely die if you fall straight down to the center of a black hole. Mm -hmm. The tidal forces, the kind that still made the bulge of the tidal wave, those same forces will stretch your body as your feet fall to the center of the black hole faster than your head does. And your body begins to stretch. Like Stretch Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll stretch so significantly that ultimately you will snap into two pieces as the tidal forces exceed the intermolecular forces of your flesh. You will likely snap at the base of the spine first. And then as those two pieces kept falling to the abyss, those two pieces would snap into another pair, and then another pair. And you'd be bifurcating, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, until you're this stream of atoms descending into the abyss. And that's not even the worst thing that'll happen to you, <laughs> okay? Because, <laughs> it's uh, it, no, it's not. No, 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 no. So in the black hole, the fabric of space and time funnel down to a point, a singularity. So as you fall to the center, you occupy a narrower and narrower range of space-time. And so as you get ripped apart head to toe, you get extruded through the fabric of space, like toothpaste through a tube. That's if you <laughs> yeah, have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. No. Bye, guys. <laughs> no. so, so both of those will happen to you going to the center. But if you have a trajectory that does not go through the center, and you have, and we're, we, people try to work out what this would be. In principle, this will not have to happen to you. And you could conceivably survive a trajectory into a black hole. Getting out is the hard part. But uh, we, maybe aliens made this wormhole for us. We don't know how to make a wormhole. This, it's a wormhole. And, there's a, and, 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 that, and there's a, there are black holes there. So there, there might be trajectories out of black holes where you're still intact. And we have people working on that. And that was some of the, the, the fictionalized storytelling of the film. That's why it's called science fiction. Right. You, know, you get some science right, and then the rest is fiction. And now the fact that he would be jettisoned from it and land in exactly the right spot to then sort of. In this tesseract, they call it. Oh, the tesseract. No, that's different. OK, so that's... now you're in the black hole. OK, so and we're in a... the black hole now. So ask that. All right, this idea of this tesseract where you can alter things that have already happened in your lifetime. Can we do that? Yeah, so no, so you didn't ask that correctly, okay? <laughs> you, you, you were very human about it, and you said alter things that happened. The interesting thing about the Tesseract, a word that has gained some currency with the, uh, with the films, the, the Avenger series, because there's right. a Tesseract that with Thor and people move in and out of it. All right, so the Tesseract, mathematically, is a higher dimensional object. Well, if you have access to a higher dimension, it means you are no longer bound to where you are in time. We, though we can move left and right, and up and down, and forward and back, we have access to X, Y, and Z at will. But you are a prisoner of the present, forever transitioning between the past and the future. In a higher, that's the fourth dimension, X, Y, Z, and time. In a higher dimension, you can step back and look at your entire timeline and access it no differently from how you just walk around in a room. So the question, can you go back in time to change something, that's not even the right question. Once you see your entire timeline, you are always being born. You are always dying. You are always in school. You are always asleep. You are always brushing your teeth. These things are always happening, and you just access them at will. So in the Tesseract, he's not changing the past. That always happened. We saw it happen. Jessica Chastain, as a child, saw the books come out. It's a mystery why. We find out why. Because her father does go into space, does go into the black hole, does access the Tesseract to try to tell her to have him not go. But here's the weird part. He did go. He had to go. Otherwise, he couldn't be telling her that he shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. That's the whole, <laughs> okay? Right? Oh, my so, brain hurts. Watch what happened. Yeah, so, think about, so think about this. Think about this. If she did interpret his signals correctly and managed to prevent him from going, then he would have never given her the signals in the first place to tell him to not go. So that entire series of events 
had to unfold exactly as portrayed. And so you're wrong to think that you're going to go back and change something in a timeline that is already there. So, yeah, I can, it can make your brain hurt because we are, we are prisoners in our own four dimensions. And in higher dimensions, really cool stuff can happen as portrayed in the film. When I watch a film like Interstellar, it makes me want to go into space. I, I really hope that I'll see that opportunity before I die. Do science fiction films make you want to go into space? Um, not if bad things happen. <laughs> Gravity. Yeah, yeah. Is there, has there been a science fiction film that didn't proceed like this? People go into space and something bad happens. I think that's, there's the whole plot of every single science fiction film you've ever seen. Uh, I think, uh, I interviewed Christopher Nolan for my radio show, Star Talk, Star Talk Radio. Uh, we haven't aired it yet, it'll come out in a few weeks. And I learned that he was deeply influenced by the film 2001, mm -hmm. A Space Odyssey. I'm it's his old, favorite film ever. Yeah, I, I, I'm old enough to have seen it like in real time when it came out. I think I'm a little older than he is, so he had to catch it on the upswing later. Uh, back then, they would re-release the film to theaters because no one had video access, home video access. So that was deeply influential to him, and I understand why. Big, sweeping scenes of spaceships docking and traveling among the planets. How could you not want to be on those voyages? So, I agree, a well done science fiction movie makes you want to participate in that future. My favorite films include, uh, yes, 2001, but coming into modern times, definitely the film Contact, the Carl Sagan story. That one, they put a lot of effort into how people on Earth would react to the discovery of intelligent life in the universe, life more intelligent than we. Uh, that, I thought, a lot of good effort was put into trying to make that accessible and, and plausible. Uh, other films, uh, I thought Planet of the Apes, that's an, the original from back in the 60s. I looked at that again recently, and that has held up. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was another one of these Einsteinian things. They didn't age, but all the rest of the Earth did. Mm -hmm. But that was just a moment to set up the story. They didn't keep visiting that fact. But just the idea that apes would rise up and the apes themselves were segregated. The intelligent class was the, the, were the chimpanzees. And the, the diplomats were the orangutans. It was an interesting, I didn't, when I first saw it when I was a kid, I didn't put all that together. But even in that world, people sort of segregated by what species of ape you were. And, and the, the, the police were the, were the gorillas, right? They, so must be what we think of the various apes. I wonder what those apes think of think us. Think of us, right? <laughs> so uh, that, I thought, was... If a science fiction story can't hold up a mirror to what's going on in the world in which you live, I think the story fails for me in some fundamental way. And, and at some point you want to reflect on what's going on in your own world by virtue of this story told in space. And so for me the best science fiction stories do that. And, and take the whole Star Trek series, for example, is all about that. Thank you so much for debating the mysteries of the universe oh, with sure, me. Fine. I could Thank do you. it all day. Uh -huh. Can I have a hug because my brain hurts? Oh, I'm a hug boy. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you so all much. Right.